Um, last week's lecture was a bit unusual, but it was to give you a flavor of what it is to present uh, Buddha Dharma, something that cannot be taught um, and in a way in which uh, can be in some way beneficial to the, to the sentient beings that you're presenting this to. Today, I wanted to continue that with, um, uh, from the book of um, Master Shen Yang, uh, uh, Attaining the Way, uh, the section that probably most people don't really review too much is the one on the, the Master uh, Ji Xian. And, and Master Ji Xian was from the 17th century. So from the 17th century view, he's had a, an opportunity to, to assess uh, the Chan school for, for hundreds of years. And he's writing from this viewpoint, let's say at this point, it's almost a modern day viewpoint, just a little bit uh, still ancient master, but it's a, it's a modern day perspective looking at it and he's sitting there and he's wanting to write down what it is to be a Chan master. But in writing this down to say what it is to be a Chan master, he's recording two parts. One is what it is to be a Chan student and the, and the other is to develop a guidance for future Chan masters and instructors as to what they should be doing in this and presenting this as just as I did last week, this um, kind of perplexed and uh, kind of way of, of how do you teach something cannot be taught. And, um, and it has been the skill of Chan masters for hundreds of years to be able to do that. And the only way that it can be taught in this way is this one mind, one heart that the one mind and one heart of the Chan master is not other than the, the Buddha nature that uh, we have uh, within us that is, which is listening at this very moment is not other than as Master Ling Chi said, is the, the, uh, the mind of the Buddhas and the patriarchs. The difficulty in all of this is, is that we, have to look at this mind and realize that the appearances appear to be that this mind is coming from our heads and coming from our, our sense of, of being, being me being in this room and seeing things. But the Buddha mind is not this way. It would be like a dream uh, creating um, a, a, a dream world and then being absorbed in that. And the dream cannot do that. It is what they, the ancients have talked about many times that this is like the horns um, on a hair, on, on a rabbit um, or the hair on a turtle. Such things are non-existent. But because of our habitual tendencies, we've grown to rely on this reliance. And we are really nothing but like a hermit crab, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, fitting into this physical body and believing that this physical body is reality. And so the Chan master's responsibility is to say, you know, this is, this is a dream. And it is something that that is very important. I remember going once quite a few years ago to Taiwan. And at that time, um, I was at the Chan Hall and, um, and Guo Qi was, was there. Uh, and he had a bunch of university students there. And he had said, um, uh, out, and I was talking to university students and he was sitting up further away at, and he just uh, looked at me and, and, and I heard this voice say, Gilbert, I, I hear that you are enlightened. Are you enlightened? So it was very interesting, you know, because he's there and he's, he's testing me. So 
what, what would you say? You know, you could say no, um, which would be a conventional way of saying things, but it wasn't for the benefit of the people around. And he was asking for the benefit of the people around. Um, and so I said to him, this is a dream, asking a dream about a dream. And instantly, because of mind to mind, there, there's an immediate connection there. Um, and then we began to talk in a very strange Chan talk, uh, he and I, uh, with Chief Asha, and and finally, he said to the students, pay attention, because he's not talking to, to me. He's talking for the benefit of you. And they went, what? Because they didn't understand this strange Chan language that we were talking about. But it is in this way that the, the, the teachers, and I guess you know that I, I hesitate to say teachers, present the Chan in this way. That, that it is something that we have to use as many expedient means as we can to try to reach people. Uh, but it is very, very serious business, as is the study of Chan is very serious business, but we have to know how to go about it. And so for, for this master, um, and I, I don't know whether I'm kind of butchering his name, Ji Shan, J. I E X I A N, but in, in any case, uh, this master has written something very great, and and Shifu Master Shen Yang realized this and put this in this book for posterity uh, for for future reference, and 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 it is very fantastic. This is uh, the book Attaining the Way, and it's the I believe the the second. Uh, chapter of the masters that are that are being uh, that are discussing Chan. So let's go into it with that kind of a preface and see what he says. Uh, his his presentation is in, in very uh, invaluable. A Chan master occupies a true position uh, of the of the Buddhas and the patriarchs. So he must continue the family heritage of the Buddhas and the patriarchs. This is very interesting because he's talking about this family heritage. This is a connection, this one heart, one mind that I'm referring to and is, which is the, the subject of these lectures is not just simply me talking about different masters and, and what they said and historically, this time I'm, I'm going to the, the, the very heart of the, uh, of the practice. Uh, this that this ekayana this this one mind and and looking at it in a way in which this is a family heritage this is what i um if if a shifu was a shoemaker then i would be a shoemaker uh, if he was a construction uh a, um worker or a carpenter i would be a carpenter this is the family heritage that he's passed on to all of his Dharma heirs. And so we have to continue this family heritage. This family heritage is one that there are those that are that guide, and then there's those that, that follow until they realize that they, they should guide as well. In the, uh, the Sutra, Tathagatha Garbha Sutra, um, there's one called the uh, Uttara Tantra, but, but the, uh, another name for that sutra is the Ratna Gotra Vibhaga Sutra. And here the term Ratna is very interesting because one of its meanings is uh, clan, um, C-L-A-N, kind of like the Shakamuni clan of, of people. But this Ratna means absolute. And so this is the absolute clan. And so we are all part of this by virtue of our, our connection with mind. Not your mind, not my mind, mind. And so this Ratna clan is what, what this master is referring to right from the very beginning. This is the family heritage. 
What is a family heritage? Is, is to awaken people. We've got to do that. And we have to, to uh, use as many expedient means as we can do that. And if we don't do this, we're wasting people's time. If all I'm going to do is teach you how to sit like a potted plant, I have two potted plants here. Do, do you think I can awaken them? Just simply by they've been here and listening to this lecture. I don't teach potted plants. So we have to, to derive them and the power of that's innate within each of the people that we we try to reach. We try to generate that and generate that power. And, and from that power, then the people can awaken. They awaken not to themselves, but to the self nature of mind. And then there is no self. So we continue. He functions as a master and exemplar to humans and gods. So he must open the eye of wisdom for humans and gods. So what is the eye of wisdom of humans and God? Buddha nature. What is the family heritage of the Buddhas and the patriarchs? It's finding people capable of sustaining the enlightened lineage. If you act as a Chan master, but cannot cause sentient beings to awaken to their Buddha nature, this is called stealing the name of a Chan master. If you occupy the true position um, of, the, of the Buddhas and the patriarchs, but you cannot develop and expand the human potential on behalf of the Buddhas and the patriarchs, this is called usurping the position. To enable sentient beings to awaken to their Buddha nature, you must take great pains with your mind. You cannot uh, make them awaken to the Buddha nature unless you figured out how their minds work and trimmed away the false consciousness um, that brought all machinations of their conditioned minds to an end. So in what we're doing, we, we have to understand how mind works. Now, some of you have been with me for a long time. You know that my, my form of practice is called mind work. Precisely for a reason. Because we're looking at it from the right end of the telescope. When we look at the telescope and we have it backwards, everything appears to be so far. But when we turn it in the right way and we look through the lens, Everything is so close. It's intimate. Intimate because it is just our very mind that we're looking into. How could more intimate can that be? If you have an intimate relationship with somebody, um, uh, perhaps a loved one, a close connection with them, you will feel that. But here, this intimacy is even beyond that because it is your very self-nature. And, and so this is my work, constantly coming back and saying, awaken, don't you know that this is the same? One heart, one mind. This is how it works. So what good does it do to tell the people, sit on your cushion, don't think. All sorts of problems can arise from that. And we'll get into that uh, uh, with uh, Ji Shang's, uh, what he speaks of later. I, unfortunately, I wish I had a whole um, retreat to go over uh, what Ji Shang has said here because it's worthy of that exploration. So we continue. You cannot find suitable people for the Dharma gate unless you make them work diligently and courageously 
and fully mobilize their energies and undergo the rigorous course of tempering and training. So he's telling you, this is not an easy task. This is not something that you just simply have everybody line up and you hand them lollipops and they, they go back to their seat and they can lick on it all day long. This is something that requires you to inspire them to try hard to go through this rigorous training. Uh, like the one master who spent the entire winter uh, in a retreat. And um, one spring day, he smelled the, the scent of uh, the plum blossoms on the tree. And he indicated that only by going through the, the, uh, the bitter winter um, is one able to, to perceive the scent of the, the plum blossoms. And it is in, in this way. We are not self-flagellants. We don't beat ourselves, but we apply ourselves. This is mind work. So we apply it. But what is important, which I've said many times, is that we know which end of the hole to use when we tend to our garden. We don't use the pole side. We use the part that cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts. And in this way, we, we are using it in the right way. But nevertheless, what we cut is the, the illusions. We don't have to toss them out and push them all the way out. We just have to cut through the illusion moment to moment to moment. And when we do this, this is something that's uh, very important. He continues, therefore, to become a Chan master, you must first undertake the great vow to establish a great resolve. Only then can you manifest the potential and exercise the great function of a Chan master. And what is that vow? First, to become a Chan master, you must vow to the dragons and the gods and call upon the Buddhas and the patriarchs. You must vow that if you uh, that if you can enable sentient beings to awaken to the Buddha nature, you will exert yourself in the utmost and sacrifice yourself in an attempt. You will not shrink back from this mission, even if it means wearing your physical strength and your spiritual energy, even if it's as difficult as boring through a mountain to open up a road. Oftentimes people tell me, slow down, slow down. I can't, I can't, this is my vow. And as much as I want to, sometimes I'm mindful of my body to try to take a rest, but this is something that is important, this vow. It's important every day when, when I wake up, that vow is there. And, and even before I go from my, my second story, where my bedroom is to, my, to the first story, I'm already making vows to deliver sentient beings. As I'm walking down the stairs, this is my daily practice, to help people, to alleviate them from suffering. And I make this conviction to myself every single day. And I try to live the days in this way. This is how you practice. This is how you, as a student, should practice. If you really want to, to know about this, this is how you practice. You must vow that you, if you can develop and expand the human talent for the Dharma life, you will endure the hardships and not be afraid to continue, even if it means working day and night without sleep and food like gnawing on, on snow or chewing felt um, to, uh, to get rid of your, your thirst and your hunger. Um, Schiffer used to say working with a Watteau is like a dog chewing on cotton. A very, very interesting um, way of looking at things, you know, because when you work with a Watteau, you have such strong expectations that it's going to deliver you something. But if you have that kind of expectations, 
is like somebody going to Las Vegas and to uh, put the, um, the, keep putting money in the slot machine, hoping that they're going to have some big payoff and win that car that's there, um, um, that's dazzled before their eyes. It, it, it's not going to happen. For the Chan masters, their path is to serve as a bridge across the realms of desire, form and formlessness and to rescue the four classes of sentient beings. They must add to the old or the age old life of wisdom of the Buddhas and the patriarchs and open the eye for the enlightenment of the world sentient beings. So what do we add? We add our expedient means of how to present the Dharma to people. We, we add what is there in terms of in modern day, what analogies can be used to discuss things. So I talk about computers and viruses and, and computers. Well, obviously 2,500 years ago, that did not exist. And they talked about ox carts. Uh, today, when we, we talk about ox carts, people are, are not that much aware of it, much less even seen an ox cart. Um, so this is what they're saying is how we add to this. What we add is not to the Buddha Dharma. We add the expedient means to, to deliver sentient beings. And, and this is something that when you're listening to a well-known advisor, they're, they're trying to help you speaking your language, speaking your culture. For the Chan, the Chan communities, a genuine Chan master is a great means by which they rely in order to become enlightened. Tempering and tr training is in the truth. It is in truth the great key that all patriarchs um, have used to, to obtain people capable of perpetuating the Buddha Dharma. If a Chan master does not make a diligent effort to temper and train his, his practitioners, then he will certainly not be able uh, to open the eye of wisdom for sentient beings and allow them to enter the way. The Chan master does not take, if the Chan master does not take the Bodhisattva vows, he will certainly not be willing to endure the hardships. So here, what, what the, the masters do is that they're, they're working on the tempering and training of the, um, of the student. Sometimes when we temper, it's like uh, working with, with steel and forging the steel. And as the steel is hot, we bang on it, bang on it, bang on it, bang on it. And when we do that, then the steel becomes stronger. Um, and uh, so this is what he's talking about is this tempering and, and the training that's there. The skill of the Chan masters know when to bang, not to harm the student, but to, to put egg them on or push them forward with that, but establish the means of training for them. So when you listen to the well-known advisors, uh, many of you go to many different classes, no, Pick up the methods that they're saying. Practice them sincerely because this practice will work. If the well-known advisor is there, they serve as, as the means of, of evidence that there is, is gold in the digging. So, so you see the, the, the tempering of the, of the master, the training of the master. You have faith in that. And you, you, you go forward. It is the master to be able to have the, the same strong tempering and training in order for one to, to do that. Little by little, your practice will mature. The sutras are always talking about the maturation of a bodhisattva. And this is very, very important. Sometimes it can be something like um, Master Hui Neng and the subitism, uh, which is uh, the sudden enlightenment. But um, this is something that 
in order for that to happen um, is not that it's just sudden like that, that somebody just picks it up and does that. Hui Ning, when he heard a verse of the, the Diamond Sutra, instantly understood. But it was simply because of years and years, excuse me, uh, lifetime after lifetime of, of practice before that, that he was suitable for that. So the subatism is there if the conditions are right. But in our practice, our daily practice, we become more mature with the practice. We have patience, we have faith in the practice. And when we, we practice in the correct way, when we see the world in the correct way, then our practice is one in which it becomes uh, stronger. We temper ourselves, we train ourselves. The masters put a ray of expedient means as to how you can practice, but it's up to you to pick those up and to, to, uh, to use them. The, the very first retreat I went to, um, I, I was so grateful to Shifu and, and understood his role as a, a Chan master. And at, at the end of the retreat, I, in my, my part to talk, I was telling him that, that what I saw from him was that he arrayed all of these these diamonds in front of him and that it was ours for the picking that whichever diamonds on jewels that were there we could pick them up he freely offered them to us and and whichever ones that we that attracted us we we could pick them up and what was so important was is that as we picked up these precious jewels in front of him, another one appeared and another one appeared and another one appeared. And Shifu, he was so happy with this kind of an analogy and he, he nodded his head in approval because it, it is in this way. This is very funny because when I saw this uh, right before uh, we were going to have the presentations of, of the students uh, there, um, Shifu had this big bowl of m and in front of him. And he, um, and he was just looking at them and, and touching them um, with, his, with his back of his finger and just rolling them the different colors and just smiling to himself. This was not a haphazard act. It was, it was the act of mind, of the heart mind that to see who who can join me who can join me in in this most mundane peculiar point right now and to do that and and it was very very interesting and even that was an expedient me because it seemed at if you would look at him so very foolish that he would just be touching the them and rolling them, but he did this for quite a while. And do you think that was by accident or that he was pleasuring himself in some way? He was teaching even, even with that. And so it is our responsibility as a student to reach out, to reach out. Don't just simply take the low hanging fruit of the master. Go for, for the, the higher fruit. You all have this ability by virtue of you being here and connecting, and you certainly have intellectual ability, otherwise you would not be able to connect to Zoom. Um, and so you have the wherewithal to do this, that you can, you can make this connection. And you, you make the connection with the master, mind to mind. This is what the master is seeking out. He's looking for those students that have this special quality. But on the other hand, Master G. Shen says, if you don't develop them, they won't be there. You can have students with great potential, but if you don't take the responsibility to work them, mind work. I don't teach 
um, sitting on a cushion. If I taught sitting on the cushion and realized that that would be there, I would go to the retreats and crazy glue your bottom to the, the Chan Hall floor and then see if that would work. The only thing that would get me is get sued for, for false imprisonment. But it doesn't work that way. It's not gluing to somewhere. It is opening up, releasing, liberating from this body using this wonderful mind don't give it a name even we use the word mind as a last resort we continue on if you want to train chan practitioners you must teach them genuine investigation of chan voila this is what i try all the time genuine investigation of chan we I don't teach you like a dog to look after and catch your tail. But that's the way some people present Chan. And it's just like a dog running around trying to catch their tail. And if they catch it, so what? I remember a long time ago, one of my dogs actually caught their tail. And it was quite an interesting thing because they had been following their tail for so long and finally caught it. There they were. The dog had the, its own tail in its mouth. And it was very interesting because the dog, you could feel the mind of the dog and the dog's going, okay, I caught my tail. What now? It doesn't taste good. Smells kind of funny. And there's nothing to this. That was the last time that dog chased its tail. Very interesting. Even the dog learned that was, there was no benefit in chasing their own tail. In practicing genuine investigation of Chan, what we do is that we, we practice this, this contemplation of mind. We don't think about mind, but we place mind at rest. Not bad, it's pretty easy, except what happens is there's the all sorts of thoughts arise. It's okay, it's natural. Those thoughts are going to be there because over eons of time, that habitual pattern has been generated. And so when we, when we have this kind of a habitual pattern, we just let it go. One of the great Chan master said that the manner in which to, to practice is to separate ourselves from all of these habitual patterns that have, have uh, plagued us over lifetime after lifetime. We let that go. We just, uh, we could say disassociate with the so-called intimacy with these with, with these patterns and look at the true intimacy from where they come from. Precisely mind, Pratika Samapada, causes and conditions never fail. Those are coming up. Where are they appearing? In mind, nowhere but mind. They're not appearing in here. They're appearing in mind. And you just let them rest they will go away on their own where do they go indeed where do the thoughts go they don't have to go anywhere because they're in mind they've never left mind is there something outside of mind no this is a genuine investigation and and this is when we're investigating chan we're investigating by way of looking into mind mind looking at mind what does it see? This incredible reflection of appearances within it. And it does not take them to be separate. It does not take them to be itself. It sees them in, in this way. We see with the an eye and look at an apple. And we see the apple and in our practice, 
what we want to do is make this apple disappear when we meditate. This is very foolhardy because where is the apple going to go to? It is just an appearance within mind. We take this eye as we meditate and after we make the apple disappear, we see this eye over here and we say, we are meditating. I am, I am seeing this, but this eye here, this perception is an illusion. Mind's eye is seeing it. If we practice from this eye, looking at this apple, we'll never get anything done because this is, this is a dream eye looking at a dream apple within mind. It's just on the surface of mind. It's not the true mind's eye that's looking at it. This is a fabrication too. So when we practice in the wrong way, we can make the apple go away. And then the eye says, I have done very good. There's nothing to see anymore. That's foolish. That's not Chan. The true genuine investigation is looking into and seeing that even this perception is gone. It is why when, when Ananda in the Shurangama Sutra said that he, that he sees it now that all of these things are an illusion and he's seen it, the Buddha yelled at him, Ananda, that's not your mind. And Ananda was shaken because he realized that he had no idea what the Buddha was talking about. The Buddha was talking about a genuine investigation of Chan. We investigate. We want to look and we want to see from where this all comes from. So he says, if you want to apply the hammer and tongs, you must first distinguish which practitioners are potential vessels of the Dharma. Master Ling Chi said, here I distinguish three categories, low, middle, high, of inherent capacity of the Dharma among my practitioners. Depending on the capacity of the practitioner, sometimes I take away the person, sometimes I take, take away um, the phenomena, sometimes I take away both, and sometimes I take away neither. I, I wish I had more time to go over those and explain to you that, or to have you try to delve into what he's talking about here in terms of taking away the person, taking away the phenomena, taking away both or taking away neither one, depending on the, the uh, ability of, of the student. Sometimes you don't have to take away anything because they're, their temper and training has already exceeded the idea that nothing need to be taken away. When we take away something it is to create a, um, how would you say it? Um, an incongruity in mind so that, so that the mind appears to be unsettled and unbalanced. And so we're, we're trying to make the student not feel comfortable in their, their present assessment of things. So if someone would say, I see um, it's the phenomenon is not real, then you take away the person, then what? And, and if you take away the, um, the, uh, the person, no, is the phenomenon real? And, and so, and you look at these and see them from a different viewpoint in terms of, of how this works. And one of them is kind of like an Abhidharma approach that everything is real and then you take that away or the Yogacara school, it's all consciousness, you take that away. And, or you, you take away neither one, 
which was the Madhyamika school, the middle way, very interesting. It said there's apparent truth and absolute truth. And, and this is a, a, a very interesting one. Um, I think I'll be talking about that on, on, on Monday um, in, in a class uh, in terms of, of how this, this approach is, um, because it, it's very, very interesting. Um, so stay tuned if, you, if that interests you. Um, and, and then not taking away anything because the student is well-tempered and well-settled. And, and so there's no need to take away anything. In fact, you would cause an undue stress on the student at that point if there's sincere practices there. So that's what he's talking about, but you have to be skillful enough to know how to do that. And you have to be patient. And I have a, a saying saying, I leave no one behind. So I try to make this as simple as I can. So those of a limited understanding still are lured into looking into this, but those with superior understanding can exceed and, and can, can really jump quickly. And, and that is a great value because those are the ones that will also help those stragglers come, come to fruition. Um, it, it's just a matter of, of the diligent work and being responsible for them. Okay, and then he was indicating that the time during when Ling Chi was alive, Tang Dynasty, that the influence of Chan was so strong and there are people of uncommon potential for the Dharma. And when the Chan masters in those days received people, they always manifested the great function and abruptly cut off the, the root of life. They used these living devices only and had no dead methods. Um, what he's talking about dead methods is just methods like say, sit on a cushion and, and you know, um, I hope that that's the best. But, but so he's looking through the ages and seeing how the Chan was differing and changing. And it's really interesting because we're in the Dharma ending age at this point. And so Master Ji Shan was at the beginning of this Dharma ending age. And he's looking at it and saying the people from before, they had um, a greater abilities. I don't think that they had greater abilities to tell you the truth. I think they had greater distractions you know, uh, than, than what we have. I mean, what are the distractions in the everyday life? I don't know. Oh, I lost it. Uh, so, so I don't know, you know, what, what those distractions are. That's just the way it is. Um, but we're constantly bombarded with electronic um, information. And so as a result of that, um, we we have a difficult time. Hold on, I just playing with my my thing. I just knocked myself out of Zoom. So uh, at least my ah, um, okay. I'll just continue. Um, he then said that. Um, in the Song Dynasty onward, people used the, the method of the Watto to investigate Chan and dead methods were established. And this is very interesting because he's coming from the viewpoint of establishing um, Chan in a, in a very um, uh, interesting way where he's referring to it as life Chan or dead Chan and uh, in the Watto. And the Watto where people use it and then they corner themselves and, and block out their mind. This is dead Chan. So the Watto, just like sign illumination, has to have an illumination aspect to it. And so it's very important in how he's doing this so that he can establish this kind of a, um, a, a proper, uh, a proper Watto. And I'm I hesitate to go into too much because I can get into a Watteau class with this, but I wanted to explain to you at least when he's referring to this as live Chan and dead Chan, what he's referring to. So when he says, coming to the Dharma ending age, the people's capacity grew more and more inferior and their intellectual cleverness uh, became more and more deeply rooted. Craziness and confusion became more 
and more prevalent and meditative concentration and wisdom became more and more shallow. So this meditative concentration and the wisdom that comes from it, from entering into a samadhi state, the samadhi states were very, very shallow. And that's what people can get into when they practice the Watto. They just surface clean and then they think, oh, there's nothing, there's nothing left here, but there's still something, but they have satisfied themselves to just accept the non-appearance of, of um, mental um, appearances within mind so that, so that they, they think everything's clean. They fail to lift up the carpet and look underneath the carpet and vacuum underneath there with where you have a uh, deeply entrenched uh, um, notions of self. So he said that they have to break through this imprisonment barrier. Um, and so, so, but some of the, uh, the masters of old used dead methods to try to do that, to stop the thoughts but they were not really practicing the true Chan in terms of there was not no longer an investigation of the mind. There was just simply a disconnecting of the function of mind and believing that to be a true Chan, which it is not. And so when you practice, you have to, um, to be sincere in your practice and you need a well-known advisor to say, you know what? You're in dead chan, you know that that's not really the the true chan that's there. There's something there, and and this is what a well-known advisor uh, does. Um, the the other day, um, one of my good friends who was listening to the lecture sent me a a, a poem um, from someone. I I don't know who the person is but they, they were talking about how wonderful they were in nature and they did all these things and uh, they could hear the bees buzzing and the brook and whatever. And I said, this is a unified mind. And I said, this is not true, true skill. They tell, if you know this person, tell them to get out of it because this is not the, the true charm. It sounds beautiful, waxing poetic about all these beautiful things. Uh, but but it wasn't something where you would say, you know, I can see the color of a fruit fly on a on a, a turd in the woods. You know, it was just nothing but beautiful flowers and sky and and clarity. You know, this is not charm. This is some kind of a sentimental viewpoint from the mind fabricated and the cleverness of the mind to try to get one to to um, uh, believe there's no further place to go. It doesn't get better than this. It does, it does, but it's difficult. But the Chan masters there to tell you that and administer this bitter medicine. Why? Because all of that doesn't amount to anything in terms of the wondrous function of the mind and in terms of, of what the Chan master has to offer. What does he have to offer? He has to offer from the very virtue of the own experiences and realizations and wanting to share the genuineness of that with you rather than allow you to, to dwell in some kind of a fanciful um, uh, scenery that's there. If they're not skillfully used even living methods all become dead methods. If one can use them skillfully, even in the midst of dead methods, you can find living methods. What are living methods? This means discerning a practitioner's potential to be a vessel of the Dharma. It means that you're, you're looking into which one of these students are going to be the ones that really can carry this forward. When members of the Chan community enter the monastery gate, the master measures them right on site and decides whether they're 
capacity is high or low. Then the master tests them with Chan stories, which are probing poles and grass shades. Probing poles is something that one would be probing with um, into the water. Just imagine a fisherman probing at the depth of the water and using a grass shade to shield from the sun so that he can see into the water. So they're using, again, these um, antiquated analogies or rural analogies, you know, um, and, and we're looking at, at the student and trying to ascertain where they're at. Um, does the student have too much self-confidence, too much self? Are they humble? Are they hungry? Are they interested? Uh, do they have, are they demonstrating a vow? All of these things is what the Chan master is looking for. You know, measure yourself against this and, and elevate your practice. This is what, what they're looking for and seeing. And when they see the people that have um, these uh, great abilities, you, you see the people that have, uh, you measure a great ability, you know. Um, and uh, we, have at least a couple of people from Russia. I, there may be more. I haven't scanned the thing. Uh, Anna um, and um, and Sonia are here, and there may be others. But I know that Anna and Sonia they were serving as translators. But to me, observing them, I realize they have a great capacity. You know. So these are the things that I say. And welcome to you here. And uh, you know, we have people from from um, from Europe as well. I'm, I'm very happy to see them there. Um, and, and they follow you because they, they have an interest in this. And it's your responsibility to bring them along. It's their responsibility to, to study. But when they, when they um, uh, listen to this, it's like as if they're taking a, a zip of, of refreshing pure water they realize that they're getting closer to the source. So they're drawn and the master is one that measures these kinds of qualities in people to know to bring them forward in, in the practice. The master plays the roles of both host and guest and carries on a dialogue with the practitioner to test whether the practitioner can mesh with the master in one continuous strand. By such means, the master sees whether the practitioner knows the existence of the one great matter of enlightenment and the practitioner's capacity as a person is revealed. So what he's referring to here is, do you, do you even have an idea that, oh, I, I erased it, um, that there is this shell this egg that you're in and that you understand that that the answer lies outside of that egg that that there is mind because most people do not have this ability to understand mind they only think mind is consciousness so they cannot see that in the proper way um, when one sees somebody that truly has an interest in going Mind can be something much, much greater than that. But I don't know. It's okay for them not to know. But what's important is that they know that they don't know. But they want to know. And that they know that the answer lies outside words and phrases. Very interesting um, individuals. But by the virtue of you being here, you all have this capacity, which is good. And, and so you, you study. It's my job, one, to make it interesting. Um, and, uh, and the other, in some ways, to make it clear. And then in other times, to make it confusing. You say, well, what good is it to make people confused? Because you're confusing not not the self nature of mind but but the ego so that the ego 
cannot process this information because the very answer that's there would lead to the elimination of the ego. And so the ego wants to back off of it, but by confusing it, you're enabling the self nature of mind to see the ego. So it's very interesting a play because you are entering the dream and showing reality and to the, the dream people, but you're not trying to deliver the dream people, you're trying to awaken the mind that's in the slumber. This is very interesting. How do you do that? It does require special skill, but those who are listening should have an interest in understanding what I'm saying, even though they may not understand or know what I'm saying, they accept there's, there's something there. Sometimes practitioners with a high potential to be vessels of the Buddha Dharma come and the master receives them with lion's teeth and claws and with the awesome ferocity of an elephant king. The master puts out golden traps and hurls them, uh, hurls such practitioners into the thickets of thorns to see whether they can penetrate the barrier and control rest with the master. You will see me oftentimes, especially when I'm picking on a senior student, um, and I will be ruthless um, and, and to see if they can handle what I'm saying and, and to, to destroy. And when you see a senior student that all of a sudden realizes that there was a, an erroneous aspect in, the, in their way of looking at things, they will remember that and, and they will in turn use that with the students that they will they will teach. So so you you go at it with a ferocity, but but with a kind of a tough love that you how you teach people. You teach them because of your interest in them and your interest not only in them but those who they will teach. I often say, I'm not speaking to you, and indeed, I'm not speaking to any of you. I'm speaking to those who you will bring to the Dharma. It is in this way. So when you, you see things, you, you understand it, and you, you use it by, by, the, by the potential of, of, of what, what is there. So we don't simply present it to, to one generation we're setting forth something for future generations. Again, this is one heart and one mind. Um, there's much more to Master uh, Jishan, and, and I will continue with him next week just simply because it's just a, an incredible one. And as I was reading this, it's kind of like um, a, a child learning how to be a child by being um, a mother first. And, um, and seeing it from, from, from that viewpoint. Um, so we will continue on with that. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy this and get the feeling for it um, because even though he's talking about how to be a Chan master, he's really teaching you how to be a student, okay? So we'll, we'll open it up to questions. Oh, hi Gilbert. Hello. This is Michelle. Uh, well, thank you very much for the talk. I always get some inspiration as always, so really appreciate that. And um, last week, I have a question that I didn't have a chance to ask. So now I want to be the first one, so I get a chance. Good. <laughs> uh, last week, you talk about your son, Anada, and you teach him the Dhamma talk in a very early age. So when he go to the preschool, he tell everybody, <laughs> all the phenomena is empathy and got all the students get shaken. So even the principal call you to the office. So well, this is a very unconventional way in a, in a, uh, in a sense, well, which is great. But I just like to know, you know, from your experience, teach, well, I know a lot of parents that they send the kids to the Sunday uh, Dharma uh, school, but not to this extent so deep about the empathy. About it. <laughs> so my my question is, you know, from your experience, is there any pro and con to have the kids 
Sala Dharma deep talk in such an early young age? Yes and no. I mean, um, the thing about it is, is that you, you want to give them probably more of, um, of wisdom of, of everyday choices and things that, that, that help so that you can guide them in the way. Um, one of the things, it's very funny because my son Ananda um, isn't at this point so much of, of a deep Buddhist, but he is a deep Buddhist in his actions. And what amazed me was when he was in, in high school, he devoted all his time to community service of helping the poor, helping people all the time. And, and this is something very, very amazing, you know, in terms of it. So it does help when, when you, we begin to, to present our children with, uh, with uh, what would you do, you know, kind of like uh, with the, the, the Christians say, what would Buddha, or what would, yeah, uh, what would uh, Jesus do? Um, you know, um, you might have asked Buddha, uh, but in, but in any case, uh, it's it's something that we we present, and 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 the schools are devoid of of teaching wisdom and morality and ethics, which are very very important. Um, so I think that you start there with that and you start with the idea of the ego we don't have to eliminate the ego or try to make it make it disappear in any way we 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 simply just are illuminating it and and we start that way so the earlier on with the children that we talk to we don't have to say you know like my son said you don't exist or you're not real or whatever what, what we do is we we present them with genuine um guidance and i think that that's important with that, you know, and that's that's important to those who Master uh, Jay Sean was saying that that are of uh, limited, um, uh, you know, their potential is not as great as 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 others. Um, we we do that too. It's kind of an interesting thing because I, I'll tell a quick story about that. Where Shifu uh, um, was at the beach uh, in New York, and and he was with a lot of the practitioners. And then they found the stray dog there. And so the dog was following him and following him. And finally, um, they said, Shifu, we should take the dog um, to the uh, back with us to the Chan Center. And they go, yeah, let's take the dog back to the Chan Center. And, and Shifu's like kind of shaking his head. And they go, yeah, why not? And they said, um, he goes, and, and Shifu, you can, you can teach the dog the Dharma. And, and Shifu said, I have a hard enough time teaching you the Dharma, much less a dog. <laughs> so, so the, you know, we, we do our best and, and we, we try and we try not to, you know, to harm, you know, things. But I, I still teach the Dharma to my dogs sometimes. I, I, I know that I, I just say to, to, to one, Ginger, the reason you're the way you are is because you're too selfish. You know, you want to take all of the food. You want to do this. You're too upset all the other time. And then the other one, Bandit, you know, you're so dull. You know, you don't think right. You have to think carefully about what you do. You have, you know, so so you, you nevertheless, you don't even leave any sentient beings behind. But, but so teaching children, absolutely. Okay. Um, go ahead, next question. Hello, Gilbert. It's Miranda here from Vancouver, a little bit north of where you are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation today. I am um, regarding the being a vessel to teach Dharma. As I gain more knowledge, I have this tendency to share and this tendency to go, oh, hey, I identify that as something familiar. Hey, let me tell you about this. So I could get into it until I realized, hang on just a minute here. I'm being a bit complacent here. I don't know it. I'm not enlightened yet. And yet I'm telling people or, or teaching people thinking that, oh, I'm just sharing. How would you suggest that I not get into that trap of being complacent of how much I know about the Dharma? 
This is a, re a really good question as apropos for today's uh, subject. Um, and, and I will talk to you about what Shifu said. Uh, it's very interesting because I remember um, in one retreat, Shifu had conferred uh, uh, Inca on me. And, and at that time, Inca just means that you had seen your, the, the self nature of the mind. And, and I was the, the timekeeper for the, for the retreat and doing the exercise. And I started talking about, about um, how this relates to the practice. And all of a sudden I saw this shock on the monastic spaces that were there. And, and they're going, he's teaching the Dharma. He's only a timekeeper. And, and there was nothing wrong with what I was saying. I was actually very, very helpful, but, but it was like taboo. And a lot of people will say, oh, you can't do that. You know, don't, don't, don't teach, you know, unless you're certified. And if you've kind of gone through the history of that, then you understand kind of the certification process is a little bit uh, um, struggling, let's say. Uh, but, but, it, but in any case, what Shifu said was this, and, and, and I, I relied on that, especially when I was much um, newer to this. Shifu said that if somebody asked you what pork tastes like, and you had never eaten pork, but you smelled it cooking, you could, you could tell them about that. So, so this is important, okay? Think about this because it's, you're not being pretentious because you're not saying, I am telling you what pork tastes like. I'm, I'm not telling you what realization tastes like. I'm telling you what my experience is in the practice and maybe it's a little bit above that person. So you use your sincerity to do that. And there's many people here that have groups and are practicing and 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 studying and, and teaching, you know, um, Eon has a group, you know, and he has not been certified as far as I know, right? So he's like kind of illegal, you know, um, and we might have to deport him at some point. But but I don't have a problem with him because I I have faith in him and I have faith that that he will present it in the right way. And then Robert, I don't have to worry about because Robert just simply parrots everything that I say, and that's fine, you know, um, and 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 that and and that's good in terms of that. So so people who have some ability, let them do that as long as they don't say I am a um, a master or a Dharma teacher or 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 I mean or some kind of elevated classification, but they teach the people in accordance with their ability. It's not bad. If not, you know, what do you do? It's like kind of like uh, like the monkeys, you know, like this. And then nobody knows anything. But somebody has to dare to step forward and to to present the Dharma. And and so so this is how you you go. I mean, up until that point, I was acting without papers, too. I mean, you know, um, or a certificate, uh, but I, I strongly encourage people to do that, not necessarily to take the role and call themselves, you know, um, a, a name, but to help others in, in their ability, but they have to be sincere and honest. They cannot be teaching what they do not know. And one of the things in terms of I learned from the very beginning was that to, um, to have whatever I present supportable by buddha dharma whether it's it, whatever i'm saying is the words of a of master in a treatise or in a sutra you, you will not find me talking about something outside of buddha dharma and and that's what keeps you honest with it and the only thing is you have to understand okay Ken, do you really do you really understand this part if it gets into the more tricky areas then you have to back off and say i don't know 
I don't know. One of the things that was very interesting that, that the Dalai Lama said once is somebody asked him, you know, what happens when you die? And the Dalai Lama said, I don't know, I haven't died yet. And that was a, an incredibly honest answer, you know, honest to, to the practice, because he's not saying something like st stupid or whatever. Obviously, you know, the Tibetans have certain practices that are very high level in terms of, of that. But, but his honesty in terms of doing that, I think is, is, is uh, something that helps us as guidance. But, but to present things to people, I think that that's helpful. Um, it, you have to be very careful. I have one student that was trying to present mine to others and they thought that she was out of her mind. They had no idea. And, and she's talking about it because she understood it, but they had no idea. She, and she didn't have an idea how far she had progressed. And, and so as she was presenting it to them, she thought that they, they were capable of doing it, but they were like what Master Jishan said, uh, were people of lower ability. So they kind of like poo-pooed her and said, you know, that that was crazy. So you, you have to understand, but this is how you learn. This is how you begin to practice and, and how, you, how you study. It, it is no um, mistake or fluke that I'm here you know, um, there, you know, in some years I've counted that I've, I've taught um, uh, over 250 classes in one year. I mean, that's how many times I've done, that's not including, you know, individual uh, things or, or preparing for things, just simply actually giving lectures. And, and so, so when you when you do that, you know you become good at. It. So so keep going, keep going. You and and bring people along. You know, bring them along. Challenge them to investigate Chan. It's very important. This is mind work. We have to work from this idea of of the mind. And if we can do that, then we're we're doing the the right way. So it was a very good question. Thank you very Especially much. I'll try. Thank you so much for your encouragement and your light one. Thank you so much. Yes. And, and it, like I said, it was an apropos question, it's an important question, you know, as to what we're doing. You know, I don't want people to set up shop and say that they're a master painter, you know, when they're drawing stick figures. But on the other hand, you know, there's some of you like, like Sue, I always tell Sue, you know, you have to, you have to present the Dharma. And she goes, I don't want to present the Dharma. And I go, but you're really good at it. You have a good understanding. And the more she, she does that, more people follow her, the, the stronger she will get in terms of this. You got a question, Sonia? Unmute yourself or unmute her. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to, to add a few words on uh, Miranda's question because I was um, I was thinking much of these questions because um, uh, speaking of my background, I'm working as a dance teacher. So uh, a few years ago, I was thinking about oh, I'm not good enough. So how can uh, how could I be supposed to teach people? But I I, I remember what I was thinking about and. Um, I knew so many uh, things from my teachers. I know so many precious things from my teachers who were in the, these things actually uh, gave me a lot of leaf power. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> I felt so blessed uh, having this knowledge. So I decided that I will be honest and just uh, keep on studying by myself and but also teaching because I was thinking about my gratitude to my teachers <laughs> like they gave me so much and I want to share it because uh, I feel happy because of my knowledge and I want to share it uh, for my students and I was thinking about it uh, in the context of Buddhism because uh, when I was uh, taking how, how do you say it, the vows of uh, 
like taking a refuge, right? Taking a refuge. It was uh, quite long ago, and I was thinking about uh, the precept of of uh, not saying lies. I, I was wondering if it's possible, <laughs> because we are saying lies uh, all the time. Uh, but uh, I, I still remember the answer I got, uh, and the answer was um, um, like there is uh, there is no such thing as um, an absence of light, but you can uh, uh, you cannot do. Um, Sorry, <laughs> I'm nervous a little. Uh, and they say that I should not uh, uh, tell people that I am enlightened because this is a very great lie <laughs> since I am not uh, enlightened. And I have decided that uh, I have a realization on which level I am. So uh, to be honest uh, with myself, uh, just to be honest with myself, uh, just not to say that I am enlightened is right for me. But as soon as I understand just a few, maybe I can share just a few. That's my, my, my thoughts of it. And uh, I think that on uh, I, 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 I already had the question. Um, uh, Gilbert, what do you think about uh, uh, this uh, Chen uh, activism, like um, creating the groups and uh, giving the effort to create a community? I think that that's a great idea of uh, like uh, supporting the community of uh, Chen uh, studying. I don't know. Uh, maybe you can uh, give us some tips how to uh, how to how to remain uh, one with the community and how to support our Chinese communities. Maybe uh, there is uh, some tips for us uh, who know so little. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking yeah. too much. <laughs> in, in the future, um, uh, just kind of like a, uh, what I'm planning, uh, unfortunately, because uh, I was working with my senior student sent and she's in India caring for her parents I kind of put it on a back burner for right now, but I'm going to conduct a, a class a very extensive class on on um, on being a Chan presenter um, and and the like I mentioned a very, very extensive one not just simply say let's talk about the dharma or whatever what problems come up what what situations are there how do you do this what so that so that um people feel more comfortable with that that's something that i wish i had you know um um when i still had training wheels on um but it just comes with time but a lot of that has to do with just just uh, teaching, but it helps to have somebody, a well-known advisor, explain just like what Master G. Sean is doing here. I I would do an every um, um, a modern day uh, way of doing that. The thing about it, you need not have to worry about things as long as you have a sincere heart. There's one heart, one mind. You will be protected. When I first started out, I I was like like you, I didn't know, you know, um, I was kind of um, about this far ahead of the people that I was, I was, uh, I was teaching to. And I, I might have been just the very day before reading from a book and sharing that, you know, and, and little by little that gap got greater and greater in terms of that. But in the beginning, I, I, um, I felt that way, but what I did that was really helpful to me was that before every class, I would I would go and say, "May Man Manjushri and Kuan Yin Bodhisattva they take over this body and take over the mind and express the Dharma." I freely give this this vessel to you, so that so that the the uh, the Dharma can ring true, and. And that helped a lot. It really helped to not have a sense of self when one is is presenting. And 
and to have a, this kind of a borrowing at that point, um, a bit of lion's roar from them. At that point, it wasn't really a lion. It was more like a kitten's roar. Um, but but in, in any case, it, it was something in terms of, of doing that where now, you know, I, I feel comfortable. But in the beginning, this is how, how we do that. It makes it makes it there. OK, um, Sue says Michael has some words to say. Uh, yes, hi, Gilbert. Uh... I just wanted to say first, uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, for your uh, for your words that you shared with Sue that you had Sue share with me yesterday. It really uh, provoked a profound change in uh, the trajectory of my future. I uh, I've never experienced uh, this sort of desire to uh, you know to learn more about a spiritual practice before. So thank you for inspiring that within me, and thank you so much for your kind words. And I did have one quick question. Um, so I do normally meditate by myself, but not in any sort of structured environment or setting. And I was wondering what the best way for me to learn how to properly sit would be. I, I think the most important part is, is that to, to sit properly is, is to, to sit with a clear understanding of what you're doing on the cushion. And that when you sit with a, with a true and proper understanding then it helps a, a, a lot. If you're sitting there and you're just trying to squat away thoughts, that's not good. But if you're actually doing mind's work, which is investigating via keeping the mind in the present moment and contemplating your method and, and begin to learn how to contemplate, then that helps. Uh, you can practice by using direct contemplation, um, just, uh, uh, you can go somewhere, look at, at an object and just look at the object for a long period of time, giving it no name, no impressions or anything, just simply see it as it is. Then, uh, then when you go to sit to the meditate, you can use that same um, manner in which to practice and, and uh, apply that to your method so that you look at your method directly. And, and in this way, you, uh, the, the mind will become clear rather than you trying to, um, to block thought. Um, the thoughts will, uh, will be there. The mind will appear to be porous and, 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 and very expansive and has room for all of these thoughts that arise, but one is not um, uh, enamored with any of the thoughts other than the, the immediate thought of the directly contemplating um, the method. And then this is probably your best, best way as you begin to practice, okay? Don't look for any experiences. That's, that's the biggest bugaboo that people have is that they're always looking to have some kind of experience, you know, to, to tell me, you know, and, um, and Eon, what would I tell them if they told me that, you know? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank um, you. So um, uh, I'm, I'm training him to be a parent like Robert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but 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 not not yet. Um, you know, and, and you, you just answer yourself that way. You know, I, I one day I'll, I'll go to a retreat and have not yet on, on a T-shirt. Uh, so when I do the interviews with people, the, they will know their answer right away. <laughs> but in any case, yeah, just practice. And don't look for experiences. You know, e even the highest level practitioner sometimes gets uh, confused and, and is looking for those experiences that are there. And again, that's all low hanging fruit. You, you want to just kind of stay right in there and stay in the saddle and, and, and try to to. Uh, um, keep pushing and perfecting the method. It's the perfection of the method. And, and the other aspect is the continuous practice of it. So you have to perfect the continuous practice. It does you no good to practice for five minutes and then have a, watch a movie for 15 minutes and then try to come back to it. You're setting a very poor um, pattern of practice, okay? Okay. Um, 